So I'm going to, uh, I, what I really want to do is, is talk about uh, years of work and the comprehensive prepaid care system model that really is a cornerstone of the uh, Affordable Care Act, that whose uh, goal it is is to try to scale up and dramatically expand a whole series of care system changes uh, that, that we and others seem to have that uh, believe uh, significantly increases the chances of individuals with disabilities of all ages uh, of maintaining their independence and autonomy in the community as opposed to going to a nursing home. Um, and so I just said facetiously, let's change the top line here is to be or not to be home, is that the real question? The real question is really, how do we take what we kind of know works from a system point of view uh, and systematically scale those to see if we can dramatically uh, 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 keep a larger segment of people home that otherwise uh, would be going uh, to facilities. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and that really, I, I want to say, is that the, the engine for that really is the, uh, is the Affordable Care Act. We're hearing a lot of uh, issues around the Affordable Care Act, a lot of politics, a lot of noise. Uh, but one of the areas of the Affordable Care Act that I think there's universal agreement, and, and I want to believe in all segments, uh, in both of the country as well as the political spectrum, is that um, we really have to use our Medicare and Medicaid dollars in a far more effective way. Our Medicare trust fund has uh, got uh, 10, 12 years left on its uh, before insolvency, and Medicaid programs, as we know, are, are called the budget busters. They compete in state for uh, amazingly uh, important uh, prior other priorities, uh, education, public safety, and the like. And, and we have to find a better way to put those dollars together. Uh, and quite frankly, this is one of the few areas potentially by improving care and promoting independence is also a way we believe and hope and the demonstrations underway as part of the Affordable Care Act will show uh, uh, our ways of both uh, improving the cost performance of uh, Medicare uh, and Medicaid and also improving care and keeping people independent. So the real question is how do we do this and what do we uh, uh, and, and what have we learned? And so the lessons from Commonwealth Care Alliance we've been privileged to be uh, really one of the demonstrations here in Massachusetts for a number of years that's informed the national uh, uh, demonstrations that are rolling out across the country as part of the Affordable Care Act uh, in, uh, in, in how, what is needed in terms of change. And I'm going to start by, since I'm a physician, I'm going to start by just giving a couple of cases uh, and I'll promise to translate uh, the medical jargon uh, into English uh, for those who are not, not clinicians. And, these are cases that have come our way and we're very familiar and represent the kinds of issues uh, both from a policy and clinical point of view.
breakdowns, infections, and all the cascading problems like that. Um, for years, Anna was uh, living, uh, had a manual wheelchair because she had arm strength, but in recent years, her arms were starting to get weaker and more spastic, and she couldn't manage her catheterizations, and she couldn't manage her wheelchair. We have, uh, I'm, I'm proud to say, and proud to have served uh, in, in a leadership position, I think one of the most progressive Medicaid programs in the country, by far, in terms of its benefits and what's offered. And Anna, and we were the very first one in the country, or one of the first that offered a personal care assistant benefit as an alternative to nursing home placement or institutionalization. Uh, and Anna had Medicaid-funded personal care assistance that uh, was approved many years earlier, but was kind of stuck in time and place. Two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, and we have her story that she's in some kind of decline. And even the best, uh, 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 most progressive Medicaid program doesn't have the, the sophistication and the sensitivity to do the modulations from a distance. And that's one of the things we we learn, and there's often over-resourcing and under-resourcing. In this case, there was under-resourcing, uh, and she had no adjustments. Um, now, Anna uh, lives around the corner from a, one of the most uh, uh, robust community, mental health, community health centers in the, world, in, in, in the country, here in Massachusetts, uh, and yet she might as well have been living in Uruguay. And uh, because if you look at her needs, uh, she's mobility dependent, she has emotional needs, she has neurologic impairments, um, uh, addiction issues, chronic lung disease, all of that issue. Um, if, in fact, uh, she were to wheel into that health center and be in the waiting room, a physician would probably hold his chest in that, in that uh, in, you know, seeing, uh, in, in, in given the exigencies of, uh, of primary care practice in the fetus service world, where he, the, the predominant model are, are, are very frequent, the short 15, 20, 25 minute vi visits, uh, with a pretty narrow focus on the medical spectrum of issues. And if you look at the range of her issues and her history, known and, 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 and needing to be uh, 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 elucidated, you, yeah, this is going to take a far broader and more comprehensive look than anything that that physician can do, and certainly in that 20-minute visit. So that physician is essentially saying, if I don't see Anna in here, my day is a lot smoother because I don't know what I can do for uh, Anna. I was one of those physicians once, uh, many years ago, and that's what started this odyssey about something's wrong with this picture. How do we take care of people like, 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 like Anna? Um, now, what happened is uh, she also had significant mental health issues, um, but she really couldn't get to a, a, a have a meaningful relationship with a behavioral health clinician. And quite frankly, she couldn't have a meaningful relationship with a neurologist even though we're sitting in the most resource-rich specialty environment in, in the planet, right, right here. Um, and why was that? Um, well, for, uh, in terms of mental health clinics, uh, if you have two what we call do not keep appointments, uh, you miss them, uh, you're out, you're off the books for a year. Well, if, you, if, you, if you're Ann or you're dependent on, in Massachusetts, but on the ride, publicly funded ride, and if you say you have an appointment at uh, 10 o'clock, to see a psychiatrist or a primary care physician or a specialist, the ride may show up at eight, may show up at nine, may show up at 10, may show up at 11, may show up at noon, may not show up at all. Uh, you're dependent on a, on a capricious system. And you mentioned transportation, uh, uh, it's critical, it's absolutely critical, but reliable transportation is absolutely there. And particularly when some rule-based stuff says you gotta take somebody that has got disabilities in the broiling sun or in the freezing, uh, a winter and have them sit out on the sidewalk and wait. We not not in there. It's not going to be an effective way of using transportation. So she misses the appointment. She's off the books and she doesn't get mental health care because she doesn't fit into a care system that defines itself by the buildings that it's in and by appointment systems. And it doesn't fit her name. What happens to her? You the clinicians can absolutely predict what's going to happen in terms of what the complications are going to be. Uh, in her case, well, she's going to have urinary infections because she's unable to manage um, uh, the procedures that are needed in terms of her, her, her bladder drainage. Uh, she clearly is going to have respiratory complications and infections. She's actively smoking and addicted, and it's the most powerful addiction there is. And she's got pre-existing chronic lung disease, which doesn't take much to trigger bronchospasm. And, and her main source of care is 911, uh, ambulance, and emergency room. And, um, and she's also going to have skin breakdown and infections. And in fact, in the two uh, 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 years prior to enrollment, 
uh, with us, one recurrent hospitalization after another. One for these predictable and I would say uh, in, in, in a reimagined world, totally, not totally, but mostly preventable uh, a series, of, a series of issues. And at the time she enrolled in, with, with us, um, she was emotionally withdrawn, and again, this is this issue of, and, and quite frankly, checking out. Um, and she should be checking out because the life didn't hold very much here. You're sick, getting sicker. You're uh, you're in the cycle downward in terms of of, of illness. Um, and, uh, there isn't much reason to keep going. Um, uh, and uh, she's found bed bound, incontinent, rapidly uh, uh, deteriorating uh, uh, ulcers. So that's. That's Anna, and that is a, that, that, that's a representative of a complicated uh, uh, problem that uh, it may not be exactly this way. It might be an 80 or 90 year old that is aged up with disabilities, but very often it's this mix of chronic illness, disability, psych mental health, psychiatric, cognitive, addiction, you name it, throw it all in the pot and stir it up. And, 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 and it, it's a very, very complicated mix that needs to be sorted out. I'll go a little faster. Mary, really, and I, I'm glad, you know, this, is a, this illustrates another thing. Uh, uh, this is a younger woman, 29-year-old woman born um, uh, with cerebral palsy. Uh, people know that's a, that's a congenital neurological condition, a wide variation of, uh, of, of manifestations. In her case, pretty significant. She had spastic, a lot of spasticity and functional quadriplegia, which means that she really had no use of her arms and legs. The word dysarthria is a medical term for spasticity of her throat, swallowing muscles, um, and difficulty in speaking, in her case, pretty severe, uh, because of the, the underlying neurological condition. But also, the swallowing problem creates an extraordinary risk of aspirate, what the clinicians call aspiration pneumonia. You take a, a drink, a glass of water, milk, beer, whatever, mm -hmm. you know it's going into the right, <laughs> right place. You don't know that with Anna. Uh, it, it could end up in the lungs, and that's a very serious, serious problem because of the dysfunction there. Uh, and Anna, like so many people, and, uh, uh, spent much of her childhood into young adulthood uh, in a state school. We had a, we had a superb one in Canton, the Mass Hospital School is probably the most, uh, in the country, when we think about these institutions, this may be one of the most progressive ones going. It's in our department of public health, but at age 22 she moves into the community and, uh, and, and, and Medicaid would fund personal care assistance support, she had close family. By the way, like so many people that are clients of departments of developmental disability services, formerly dependent department of, of mental retardation, probably didn't really need to be in that department. Uh, what was mistaken as intellectual impairments was probably communication impairments. And, uh, uh, and that's what happens. And, but now it's moving to independent living, but then seven years of independent living, just one hospitalization after another. And again, imagine the, dis the fit, the, 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 the lack of fit between her needs and the way medical care is organized. Uh, again, a, 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 I think a physician would, uh, uh, would, would probably have a nervous breakdown to a typical primary care. But it would take 45 minutes to move from a wheelchair to a table, which is up here. You know, and uh, uh, it, there was a complete misfit, and the same misfit with appointments and all of that. So what's happening is you see people like Anna and you see people like Mary cycling in terms of missed opportunities to intervene on the chronic illnesses and cycling in terms of their health and disability. And that is the gateway into long-term uh, you know, as Alice said, it's through the hospital and it's these chronic illnesses and the cycle down that does that uh, uh, there. And so uh, these cases, these are two of, of all ages, but we could give you many more. And that tells you what the problem is and also what the design needs are to change. And it's not just, it is very, very important to focus on appropriate allocation of long-term services support, how much personal assistance, medical <laughs> equipment, transportation, meals. These are critically important as part of the package that's alternative, uh, an alternative to this cycle of decline in a nursing home or a long-term placement. But I, I want to, I submit even more important is a reimagination of how we have to think about medical care. Uh, because if we are having a medical care system that is absolutely unresponsive to the needs of people like Anna and Mary, um, uh, that is going to have the, that's going to be the gateway. And so much of the work uh, that we do, and so much of the work uh, that uh, we're trying to demonstrate along with others, 
and the goals of the Affordable Care Act ought to reimagine what an integrated system of Medicare and Medicaid, uh, a funded system are. And, I'll, I'll ex and, and, and we're privileged to be on that, in, in, on, in, in the front of that, uh, of imagining that and demonstrating that. So what are these, now back to the policy stuff, um, you know, we, Anna and Mary are seen in our public payers. They actually represent a small fraction of our Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, but they account for a lion's share of the costs. 15%, 50%, 50%, 40%. You know, that is both the medical care, Medicare pays for doctors, hospitals, drugs, and Medicaid, which pays for support care, and nursing home care, and the like. So here we have, in these small numbers of people, uh, 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 relatively small numbers of people, uh, 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 drivers of 50%, uh, percent, give or take, of Medicare and Medicaid budgets. Uh, specifically, in the United States, there are 9 million people that have both Medicare and Medicaid, but it's actually about 2 million around the country uh, that look like Anna, that, that look like Mary, uh, in one degree or another, and are counting for 50% of the dollars on the Medicare side right there. And much of these dollars are point number two. Uh, predictable and preventable secondary complications, are, are such as the ones we described, uh, are really driving recurrent hospital contacts. And every time somebody goes to a hospital, the ambulance is six to $800. And our, when we pay for hospitals, it's an average. It's, a, it's an average of ten to twelve million dollars, ten to twelve thousand dollars per hospitalization, recurrently over and over again. So, uh, and so we see three problems here: primary care, an addition, uh, and again I'm focusing on the medical care side, is grossly under resourced. If, uh, if we look around the United States, uh, people on Medicare are under age 65 or over average seven or eight visits per person per year. 70, 80, 90, 100 bucks, is it 800 dollars per person per year? You know, we, what we learn is that you have to spend multiples of that, three, four, five times in a different model of primary care than that, that currently exists. Um, that you have to, you have to have a system which I'll describe that is able to manage the expected complications and be responsive. And then there's another feature in the American healthcare system. Uh, that is really that when the sicker you are, the more impaired you are, uh, the more likely you are to be on your own. What we call the anonymous piece of baggage is if you're on an uh, air, 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 airport conveyor belt uh, going maybe to this city or that, uh, that city. Uh, by and large, that's where the healthcare system, the medical care system, the organization of care kind of deserts you when you're needed most. And you can see how difficult it is there. Uh, so. <coughs> What are the elements of a care system? And again, this is not just us. This is a lot of work over decades have said in small scales, PACE programs and others. What are the elements? Well, we have to reimagine primary care not as a doctor in an office in an appointment, but as an interdisciplinary team. And, and it could, the members of the team could be different for different populations. Clearly, you know, for Mary, you want to really have things like physical therapy and, and durable medical equipment assessment and management because of the, that severe physical disability. But we found that generally nursing is absolutely critical. Uh, I want to say that there is absolutely nothing in the back, my background of training that gives me any competency whatsoever to assess what's the right kind of support for certain types of disabilities. Um, uh, uh, although, ironically, physicians have always had to sign the papers as if they had that, 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 that knowledge. Um, and so the teams might be a nurse, and in our case, over the years, we've always uh, developed the, this, this unique role of the of nurse practitioner in Massachusetts. We've been very fortunate to have some of the most progressive nurse practice acts, and prescriptive authority, uh, uh, delegations to nurse, nurse practitioners of, of many states. Um, and that really takes, in, in the training and education, that nursing role that understands community, function, um, uh, home assessment, environmental assessment, but now the medical care piece. And it's a very efficient way to do it. And Alice wants us to do And we found that as a, as, as a very important part of the role. Um, and and uh, in integrated behavioral health clinicians instead of somebody over there, whether it's psychiatry or psychiatric social work or nurse psych clinician, to be a part of that kind of team. 
A second piece, and, and, and this is really, you mentioned this, the individualized care plan. This, if you have that team and you have that person, what does a person need to live independently? What is going to keep them out? And it's no longer a budget against a nursing home. Uh, you can say, oh my God, you know, a nursing home costs 200 bucks a day. That's my max I can spend on hours and then transfer. But in fact, no, it isn't. It's <laughs> against the hospital as well. That one recurrent $10,000 hospitalization after another, you start thinking of it very, very differently in terms of what is it going to take. And it may take a lot of personal care assistant hours. The care plan may have medical equipment and supplies. And then, in Anna's case, you're going to get rid of that old mattress. You're going to get a specialized mattress right in there. Um, with with uh, uh, ear mattress, you're going to uh, uh, you're, you're going to have to need a lot of home nursing around her uh, uh, her, her pressure sores and ulcers, maybe on a daily basis or twice daily basis for weeks to get those those, those healed up. There's a lot of elements that you control that you can make happen. Uh, you may need to, in some communities, the members of the team should be, would not be uh, professionals. They may be members of that community that are community health workers that are connecting in terms of en engagement. Uh, the number three is critically important too. In, 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 if I were to think in American healthcare system today, one of the, a universal problem is what we call inelasticity. Most doctors go to work every day and they are booked up. I, I, 8 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock at night. <coughs> well, people like Anna and Mary, uh, they have low thresholds of complications. You've got to have a systematic response system to both respond for assessment and clinical management. And clinical management isn't trying to figure out how to get them into that primary care practice and backed up behind 10 other people for a 20 minute uh, probably worthless visit. It's to get an assessment in that home and maybe uh, you, know, all, uh, you know all kinds of other treatment. The, uh, the, if there ever is a population that needs, uh, to, that can't go it alone and needs 24 seven availability uh, at all places and all times and continuity, uh, that this is the population. And you know, Elsie, this issue of the discharge, the, the anonymity of the discharges from the hospital is absolutely astounding. And I, I would challenge you, if you want to see the visual, visual on this, Go to a long-term post-hospital facility, a SNP, on a Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. Pick Friday, okay? Then you will see the Cheryl House in Jamaica Plain or anything, and you will, any of them, and you will see the ambulances driving up from Boston Medical Center and with Brigham and Beth Israel and Mass General and Cambridge Health Alliance, and they're just pulling in it for it. Why is that happening? Well, the hospitals are staffing down for the weekend. They are trying to get, light of staff are trying to get everybody out on that Friday discharge. And where are they going? They're going to the, like you described, the call goes to the family, we're sending you right up. Well, that's not driven by clinical needs, that's driven by hospital exigency around that. Okay? And, 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 and so now they're showing up at a post-hospital skilled nursing facility where there will not be a physician on site until Monday morning, the telephone orders only. Um, and uh, the odds are you will have a very high, you will have likelihood of a readmission. So out on Friday, back on Monday, and by the way, the hospital gets paid again. <laughs> you know, so hey, life's good. You know, we staffed out, and, uh, and, and for years and years and years, this was absolutely tolerated. And another cornerstone of the ACA, Affordable Care Act, and, and, and uh, feeling like this is, some, this is maybe the most monumental piece of health legislation. Uh, actually, more than Medicare and Medicaid in 65, because we're talking about the fundamental system, clinical system change, where that was just dealing with financing, uh, it was really trying to redress that. And finally, we're saying to hospitals, uh, uh, no, 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 if you have readmission rates like that, you throw them out on Friday and they're back on Monday, you're going, uh, you're going to pay a penalty. And that's the first time that, that that's ever happened. So. Um, I'm just going to go very quickly through a few slides. It, it, Commonwealth Community Care is a specialized practice that we've developed, and I'll tell you a little about Commonwealth Care Alliance, that is organized around uh, younger people with very involved disabilities. So it could be like for Mary. And when you look at what is involved in the team, well, we'll have one full-time physician for 300 people, very involved in engagement. A nurse practitioner for, per 40. A, a nurse practitioner, full practice is 40 people, most of them home visits. The, the, we call them usually the designated daughters. They, uh, they, they become part of the 
part of the family. A behavioral health clinician of one iteration or another for 140 people, a social worker for 150, physical therapy, occupational therapy, durable medical equipment. These, uh, this is your team, and primary care is not a building, and it's not an appointment, it's a concept. So you're doing your visits in their, in their world, at home, and out, you, rather than trying to bring them all in. Uh, and that might, the composition for a frail elder population may be somewhat less intense, but it's the same, but, it, but it's the same, same principle. So Commonwealth Care Alliance, so what is, what are we? We didn't really have um, a name for ourselves. Um, it, it, now there's a name in the language of the Affordable Care Act. We're, we're in Massachusetts statewide, not-for-profit, consumer government, prepaid care delivery system. The bottom line is the best language that we have is really this is a population-based accountable care organization, top to bottom. And, and what are we? We take that ineffective Medicare dollars, Medicaid dollars, each person has an amount of money that is spent on them by Medicare and Medicaid. It's usually adjusted. Medicare has done very well in terms of the predicting the expected costs. Uh, somebody that has, uh, has had two heart attacks, congestive heart failure, some significant kidney disease, bad chronic lung disease, and a stroke, it's going to cost a little bit more than a uh, 65-year-old healthy guy that can hike up Mount Washington and has no, no issue. You, you know, what's the predicted cost? This one's up here. This one. You know, and, and, and the science of that has really moved along where you can absolutely, kind of you know, reasonably, not perfectly predict it. You get an adjusted premium for predicted cost. So we then become the accountable entity that is responsible for all the Medicare and Medicaid benefits. Everything, uh, the medical care, the hospital care, we gotta pay it or deliver it, the nursing home care, the pharmacy, nothing is out. Uh, and that is the vision of a, of a care system transformation for people like Mary and a people like, like, like Anna. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we have been a part of this, the original demonstration that's informing the current demonstration that's wrought, that will be in is Massachusetts, proud to say first again, uh, but we'll be rolling out across the country in 2014 and in 2015 as, as well. Uh, so we are now managing all of the budgets. Uh, we are not dealing with doctors who have to get somebody in and out at 20, uh, 20 minutes because they're on an income, they're, they're on a, uh, a treadmill, uh, an income treadmill by, by the, the kind of the widget of, the, of, the, of, of their services. Uh, that uh, it's gonna be important for us to see what do we to spend the money on the teams and what it takes to keep somebody in that community because we're going to be paying for that hospital care we're going to be paying for that nursing home care there's no <coughs> out um, and uh, and the like and so you really now but on the other hand you've got the resources to put in comprehensive plans and it's liberating to um, uh, uh, to, to lots of clinicians for me as a physician. Um, I could never go back and practice in the old way. I, first of all, I, I, you have to remember too many things. You, you have to pretend like you, you, you just can't do all the detail. And, and I, I would definitely wash out. I definitely need a team of, to kind of protect the, the people from me, I guess. The, uh, so today, you know, today it's really, this is, I'm gonna give you some data. This is today, we have a senior care options program, all Medicare, Medicaid dollars in. 5,400 people, 76% are people like, uh, like Anna, nursing home certifiable, they're at risk for nursing home care. But look at the dot, $300 million of Medicare and Medicaid premium for 5,000 people. D just do the math. This is telling you that this is how expensive people are. Um, and in our communities, we have 30 primary care practices and eight hospital systems, mostly in low-income communities, Lynn, many sections of Boston, Springfield, um, and the like. Uh, and now, number two, we're bringing on these younger populations, the, these the people with significant mental illness, physical disability, people like Mary. Uh, and we've had the, uh, the, the opportunity as part of our organization for years, decades, to kind of experiment on what a model looks like for younger people with disabilities. And that's what we are. But when we do that, we bring them in and invest in these teams. And uh, we last year spent $29 million above and beyond what a Medicare program would have spent on these 5,000 people for primary care. That's 5,000 people in 30 sites, $29 million in the teams, interdisciplinary teams. 
Um, we have 100 nurse, nurse practitioner, social work, behavioral health teams connected to practices as part of primary care that weren't there 10 years ago. Uh, and the other thing that's absolutely amazing in terms of the job creation is that uh, last year we funded 629 full-time in-home personal care assistance uh, for people uh, as part of care plans. And, why, and, and, and our plan now is, as Jean uh, McGuire knows here, who's working with us, is we're going to go fourfold, fivefold, scale this around the state. And you start to see the potential engine, the redistribution of Medicare and Medicaid dollars for ineffective care in hospitals and nursing homes into communities. And, you know, jobs are good for communities, particularly the relatives of the people that are you know, getting cured. So uh, that's where we are. Um, and and, I, and I, I'll, I'll leave this here, but I, this was our property. You know, in terms of all of the stuff we talk about, uh, cost performance, care performance measures, and you mentioned all of the, that we have 4.5 stars. We have a kind of, uh, I, I, I think we're uh, somewhat schizophrenic about the value of these, these, these quality measures, and we can talk about that. Um, and um, these are comparisons. All it's saying is how much more we're spending in primary care, how many nursing home admissions we're offsetting, and how we're reducing hospitalization. So that's all that. And this is the summary of the problem and the opportunity that we see that Mary and Anna and all people like her are teaching us uh, uh, need to happen. So we are uh, uh, unabashed apologists and cheerleaders for the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we, we feel here in Massachusetts that this is, uh, uh, um, that, that, that we, we have a unique opportunity once again uh, to, to, to lead in terms of the uh, fundamental transformation. And maybe the, what I haven't heard said about the Affordable Care Act is uh, maybe the most important consequence of, it, uh, of this is the fundamental care delivery transformation and innovation that, has, that is now underway which there, and for which there's no going back and there is, uh, and, and, and that has been unprecedented in, after years and years and that, that's a remarkable, remarkable thing.